Part Two of The Idiot by John Kendrick Bangs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Greg Marguerite. Part Two of The Idiot by John Kendrick Bangs. Chapter Five. Hello, said the idiot as he began his breakfast. This isn't Friday morning, is it? I thought it was Tuesday. So it is Tuesday, put in the schoolmaster. Then this fish is a little extra treat, isn't it? observed the idiot, turning with a smile to the landlady. Fish? That isn't fish, sir, returned the good lady. That is liver. Oh, is it? said the idiot apologetically. Excuse me, my dear Mrs. Pedagog, I thought from its resistance that it was fried sole. Have you a hatchet handy? he added, turning to the maid. My piece is tender enough. I can't see what you want, said the schoolmaster coldly. I'd like your piece, replied the idiot suavely. That is, if it really is tender enough. Don't pay any attention to him, dear said the schoolmaster to the landlady, whose ire was so very much aroused that she was about to make known her sentiments on certain subjects. No, Mrs. Pedagog, said the idiot, don't pay any attention to me. I beg of you. Anything that could add to the jealousy of Mr. Pedagog would redound to the discomfort of all of us. Besides, I really do not object to the liver. I need not eat it. And as for staying my appetite, I always stop on my way downtown after breakfast for a bite or two, anyhow." There was silence for a moment. "'I wonder why it is,' began the idiot, after tasting his coffee. "'I wonder why it is Friday is fish day all over the world, anyhow. Do you happen to be learned enough in piscatorial science to enlighten me on that point, doctor?' No, returned the physician gruffly. I've never looked into the matter. I guess it's because Friday is an unlucky day, said the idiot. Just think of all the unlucky things that may happen before and after eating fish, as well as during the process. In the first place, before eating, you go off and fish all day and have no luck, don't catch a thing. You fall in the water, perhaps, and lose your watch, or your fish-hook catches in your coat-tails, with the result that you come near casting yourself instead of the fly into the brook or the pond, as the case may be. Perhaps the hook doesn't stop with the coat-tails, but goes on in and catches you. That's awfully unlucky, especially when the hook is made of unusually barby barbed wire. Then again, you may go fishing on somebody else's preserves, and get arrested and sent to jail overnight, and hauled up the next morning, and have to pay ten dollars fine for poaching. Think of Mr. Pedagog being fined ten dollars for poaching. Awfully unfortunate." "'Kindly leave me out of your calculations,' returned Mr. Pedagog, with a flush of indignation. "'Certainly, if you wish it,' said the idiot. We'll hand Mr. Brief over to the police and let him be fined for poaching on somebody else's preserves. Although that's sort of impossible, too, because Mrs. Pedagog never lets us see preserves of any kind." "'We had brandied peaches last Sunday night,' said the landlady indignantly. "'Oh, yes, so we did,' returned the idiot. That must have been what the bibliomaniac had taken he added, turning to the genial gentleman who occasionally imbibed. You know, we thought he'd been, uh, he'd been absorbing. To what do you refer? asked the bibliomaniac curtly. To the brandied peaches, returned the idiot. Do not press me further, please, because we like you, old fellow, and I don't believe anybody noticed it but ourselves. Noticed what? I want to know what you noticed, and when you noticed it said the bibliomaniac savagely. I don't want any nonsense, either. I just want a plain statement of facts. What did you notice?" "'Well, if you must have it,' said the idiot slowly. My friend who imbibes and I were rather pained on Sunday night to observe that you, that you had evidently taken something rather stronger than cold water, tea, or Mrs. Pedagog's opinions." 
It's a libel, sir, a gross libel, retorted the bibliomaniac. How did I show it? That's what I want to know. How did I show it? Speak up, quick and loud, too. How did I show it? Well, you went upstairs after tea. Yes, sir, I did. And my friend who imbibes and I were left down in the front hall, and while we were talking there you put your head over the banisters and asked, Who's that down there? Remember that? Y yes, sir, I do. And you replied, Mr. Auburn knows and myself. Yes. And then you asked, Who are the other two? Well, I did. What of it? Mr. Aubernoz and I were there alone. That's what of it. Now I put a charitable construction on the matter and say it was the peaches when you fly off the handle like one of Mrs. Pedagog's coffee cups. Sir, roared the bibliomaniac, jumping from his chair, you are the greatest idiot I know. Sir, returned the idiot, you flatter me. But the bibliomaniac was not there to hear. He had rushed from the room, and during the deep silence that ensued he could be heard throwing things about in the chamber overhead, and in a very few moments the banging of the front door and scurrying down the brownstone steps showed that he had gone out of doors to cool off. It's too bad, said the idiot after a while, that he has such a quick temper. It doesn't do a bit of good to get mad that way. He'll be uncomfortable all day long. And over what? Just because I attempted to say a good word for him and announce the restoration of my confidence in his temperance qualities, he cuts up a high jinx that makes everybody uncomfortable. But to resume about this fish business, continued the idiot, fish, oh, fish be hanged, said the doctor impatiently. We've had enough of fish. Very well, returned the idiot as you wish. Hanging isn't the best treatment for fish, but we'll let that go. I never cared for the finny tribe myself, and if Mrs. Pedagog can be induced to do it, I for one am in favor of keeping shad, shark, and shrimps out of the house altogether. Chapter 6 The idiot was unusually thoughtful a fact which made the schoolmaster and the bibliomaniac unusually nervous. Their stock criticism of him was that he was thoughtless, and yet when he so far forgot his natural propensities as to meditate, they did not like it. It made them uneasy. They had a haunting fear that he was conspiring with himself against them, and no man, not even a callous schoolmaster or a confirmed bibliomaniac, enjoys feeling that he is the object of a conspiracy. The thing to do, then, upon this occasion, seemed obviously to interrupt his train of thought, to put obstructions upon his mental track, as it were, and ditch the express which they feared was getting up steam at that moment to run them down. "'You don't seem quite yourself this morning, sir,' said the bibliomaniac. "'Don't I?' queried the idiot. "'And whom do I seem to be?' I mean that you seem to have something on your mind that worries you," said the bibliomaniac. No, I haven't anything on my mind, returned the idiot. I was thinking about you and Mr. Pedagog, which implies a thought not likely to use up much of my gray matter. Do you think your head holds any gray matter? put in the doctor. Rather verdant, I should say, said Mr. Pedagog. Green, gray, or pink, said the idiot. Choose your color. It does not affect the fact that I was thinking about the bibliomaniac and Mr. Pedagog. I have a great scheme in hand, which only requires capital and the assistance of those two gentlemen to launch it on the sea of prosperity. If any of you gentlemen want to get rich and die in comfort as the owner of your homes, now is your chance. In what particular line of business is your scheme? asked Mr. Whitechoker. He had often felt that he would like to die in comfort and to own a little house, even if it had a large mortgage on it. Journalism, said the idiot. There is a pile of money to be made out of journalism, particularly if you happen to strike a new idea. Ideas count. How far up do your ideas count? Up to five? 
questioned Mr. Pedagog, with a tinge of sarcasm in his tone. I don't know about that, returned the idiot. The idea I have hold of now, however, will count up into the millions, if it can only be set going, and before each one of those millions will stand a big capital S with two black lines drawn vertically through it. In other words, my idea holds dollars. But to get the crop, you've got to sow the seed. Plant a thousand dollars in my idea, and next year you'll reap two thousand. Plant that, and next year you'll have four thousand, and so on. At that rate, millions come easy. I'll give you a dollar for your idea, said the bibliomaniac. No, I don't want to sell. You'll do to help develop the scheme. You'll make a first-rate tool. But you aren't the workman to manage the tool. I will go as far as to say, however, that without you and Mr. Pedagog, or your equivalents in the animal kingdom, the idea isn't worth the fabulous sum you offer. You have quite aroused my interest, said Mr. Whitechoker. Do you propose to start a new paper? You are a good guesser, replied the idiot. That is part of the scheme, but it isn't the idea. I propose to start a new paper in accordance with the plan which the idea contains. Is it to be a magazine, or a comic paper, or what? asked the bibliomaniac. Neither. It's a daily. That's nonsense, said Mr. Pedagog, putting his spoon into the condensed milk can by mistake. There isn't a single scheme in daily journalism that hasn't been tried, except printing an evening paper in the morning. That's been tried, said the idiot. I know of an evening paper, the second edition of which is published at midday. That's an old dodge, and there's money in it, too, money that will never be got out of it. But I really have a grand scheme. So many of our dailies, you know, go in for every horrid detail of daily events that people are beginning to tire of them. They contain practically the same things day after day. So many columns of murder, so many beautiful suicides, so much sport, a modicum of general intelligence, plenty of fires, no end of embezzlements, financial news, advertisements, and headlines. Events like history repeat themselves until people have grown weary of them. They want something new. For instance, if you read in your morning paper that a man has shot another man, you know that the man who was shot was an inoffensive person who never injured a soul, stood high in the community in which he lived, and leaves a widow with four children. On the other hand, you know without reading the account that the murderer shot his victim in self-defense, and was apprehended by the detectives late last night, and that his counsel forbade him to talk to the reporters, and that it is rumored that he comes of a good family living in New England. If a breach of trust is committed, you know that the defaulter was the last man of whom such an act would be suspected, and except in the one detail of its location and sect that he was a prominent in some church. You can calculate to a cent how much has been stolen by a glance at the amount of space devoted to the account of the crime. Loaf of bread? Two lines. Thousand dollars? Ten lines. Hundred thousand dollars? Half a column. Million dollars? A full column, five million dollars, half of the front page, woodcut of the embezzler, and two editorials, one leader and one paragraph. And so with everything, we are creatures of habit. The expected always happens, and newspapers are dull because the events they chronicle are dull. Granting the truth of this, put in the schoolmaster, what do you propose to do? Get up a newspaper that will devote its space to telling what hasn't happened. That's been done, said the bibliomaniac. To a much more limited extent than we think, returned the idiot. It has never been done consistently and truthfully. I fail to see how a newspaper can be made to prevaricate truthfully, asserted Mr. Whitechoker. To tell the truth, he was greatly disappointed with the idea, because he could not, in the nature of things, become one of its beneficiaries. "'I haven't suggested prevarication,' said the idiot. "'Put on your front page, for instance, an item like this. George Bronson, colored, age twenty-nine, a resident of Thompson Street, was caught cheating at poker last night. He was not murdered. There you tell what has not happened.' 
there is a variety about it. It has the charm of the unexpected. Then you might say, curious incident on Wall Street yesterday. So-and-so, who was caught on the bare side of the market with ten thousand shares of J.B. and S.K.W., paid off all his obligations in full and retired from business with one million dollars clear. Or, we might say, a superintendent Smithers of the St. Goliath Sunday School, who is also cashier in the 48th National Bank, has not absconded with four million dollars. Oh, that's a rich idea, put in the schoolmaster. You'd earn a million dollars in libel suits the first year. No, you wouldn't either, said the idiot. You don't libel a man when you say he hasn't murdered anybody. Quite the contrary, you call attention to his conspicuous virtue. You are, in reality, commending those who refrain from criminal practice instead of delighting those who are fond of departing from the paths of Christianity by giving them notoriety. But I fail to see in what respect Mr. Pedagog and I are essential to your scheme," said the bibliomaniac. I must confess to some curiosity on my own part on that point," added the schoolmaster. Why, it's perfectly clear," returned the idiot, with a conciliating smile as he prepared to depart. You both know so much that isn't so that I rather rely on you to fill up. Chapter 7 a new boarder had joined the circle about Mrs. Pedagog's breakfast table. He had what the idiot called a three-ply name, which was Richard Henderson Warren, and he was by profession a poet. Whether it was this that made it necessary for him to board or not, the rewards of the muse being rather slender, was known only to himself, and he showed no disposition to enlighten his fellow boarders on the subject. His success as a poet, Mrs. Pedagog found it hard to gauge, for while the postman left almost daily numerous letters, the envelopes of which showed that they came from the various periodicals of the day, it was never exactly clear whether or not the missives contained remittances or rejected manuscripts. Though the fact that Mr. Warren was the only boarder in the house who had requested to have a waste-basket added to the furniture of his room seemed to indicate that they contained the latter. To this request Mrs. Pedagog had gladly acceded, because she had a notion that therein, at some time or another, would be found a clue to the new boarder's past history, or possibly some evidence of such duplicity as the good lady suspected he might be guilty of. She had read that Byron was a profligate, and that Poe was addicted to drink, and she was impressed with the idea that poets generally were bad men and she regarded the waste-basket as a possible means of protecting herself against any such idiosyncrasies of her new-found genius as would operate to her disadvantage if not looked after in time. This waste-basket she made it her daily duty to empty, and in the privacy of her own room, half-finished ballads, songs, and snatches she perused before consigning them to the flames or to the large jute bag in the cellar for which the ragman called two or three times a year. Once Mrs. Pedagog's heart almost stopped beating when she found at the bottom of the basket a printed slip beginning, The editor regrets that the enclosed lines are unavailable and closing with about thirteen reasons, any of one or all of which might have been the main cause of the poet's disappointment. Had it not been for the kindly clause in the printed slip that insinuated in graceful terms that this rejection did not imply a lack of literary merit in the contribution itself, the good lady, knowing well that there was even less money to be made from rejected than from accepted poetry, would have been inclined to request the poet to vacate the premises. The very next day, however, she was glad she had not requested the resignation of the poet from the laureateship of her house, for the same basket gave forth another printed slip from another editor, begging the poet to accept the enclosed check with thanks for his contribution, and asking him to deposit it as soon as practicable, which was pleasing enough since it implied that the poet was the possessor of a bank account. Now Mrs. Pedagog was consumed with curiosity to know for how large a sum the check called. 
which desire was gratified a few days later when the inspired boarder paid his week's bill with three one-dollar bills and a check, signed by a well-known publisher, for two dollars. By the boarders themselves the poet was regarded with much interest. The schoolmaster had read one or two of his effusions in the fireside corner of the journal he received weekly from his home up in New England. Effusions which showed no little merit, as well as indicating that Mr. Warren wrote for a literary syndicate. Mr. Whitechoker had known of him as the young man who was to have written a Christmas carol for his Sunday school a year before, and who had finished and presented the manuscript shortly after New Year's Day. While to the idiot Mr. Warren's name was familiar as that of a frequent contributor to the funny papers the day. I was very much amused by your poem in the last number of The Observer, Mr. Warren," said the idiot, as they sat down to breakfast together. "'Were you indeed?' returned Mr. Warren. "'I am sorry to hear that, for it was intended to be a serious effort.' "'Of course it was, Mr. Warren, and, and so it appeared,' said the schoolmaster, with an indignant glance at the idiot. "'It was a very dignified and stately bit of work, and I must congratulate you upon it.' I didn't mean to give offense," said the idiot. I've read so much of yours that was purely humorous that I believe I'd laugh at a dirge if you should write one. But I really thought your lines in The Observer were a burlesque. You had the same thought that Rossetti expresses in The Woods Purge. The wind flapped loose, the wind was still, shaken out dead from tree to hill. I had not walked on at the wind's will. I sat now, for the wind was still. That's Rossetti, if you remember, slightly suggestive of blow ye winds of the morning, blow, 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 but more or less pleasing. I recall the poem you speak of, said Warren with dignity, but the true poet, sir, and I hope I have some claim to be considered as such, never so far forgets himself as to burlesque his masters. Well, I don't know what to call it, then, when a poet takes the same thought that has previously been used by his masters and makes a funny poem. But, returned the poet warmly, it was not a funny poem. It made me laugh, retorted the idiot, and that is more than half the professionally funny poems we get nowadays can do. Therefore, I say, it was a funny poem, and I don't see how you can deny that it was a burlesque of Rossetti. Well, I do deny it, in toto." I don't know anything about denying it in toto, rejoined the idiot, but I'd deny it in print if I were you. I know plenty of people who think it was a burlesque, and I overheard one man say, he is a Rossetti crank, that you ought to be ashamed of yourself for writing it. There's no use of discussing the matter further, said the poet. I am innocent of any such intent as you have ascribed to me, and if people say I have burlesqued Rossetti, they say what is not true. Did you ever read that little poem of Swinburne's called The Boy at the Gate? asked the idiot to change the subject. I have no recollection of it, said the poet shortly. The name sounds familiar, put in Mr. Whitechoker, anxious not to be left out of a literary discussion. I have read it, but I forget just how it goes, vouchsafed the schoolmaster, forgetting for a moment the Robert Elsmer episode and its lesson. It goes something like this, said the idiot. Somber and sear the slim sycamore sighs, lushly the lithe leaves lie low o'er the land, whistles the wind with its whisperings wise, gruesomely gloomy and garishly grand. So doth the sycamore solemnly stand, wearily watching in wondering wait, so it has stood for six centuries, and still it is waiting, the boy at the gate. No, I never read the poem, said Mr. Whitechoker, but I'd know it was Swinburne in a minute. He had such a command of alliterative language. Yes, said the poet, with an uneasy glance at the idiot. It is Swinburnian, but what was the poem about? The boy at the gate, said the idiot. The idea was that the sycamore was standing there for centuries waiting for the boy who never turns up. 
It really is a beautiful thought, put in Mr. Whitechoker. It is, I presume, an allegory to contrast faithful devotion and consistency with unfaithfulness and fickleness. Such thoughts occur only to the wholly gifted. It is only to the poetic temperament that the conception of such a thought can come coupled with the ability to voice it in fitting terms. There is a grandeur about the lines the idiot has quoted that betrays the master mind. Very true, said the schoolmaster, and I take this opportunity to say that I am most agreeably surprised in the idiot. It is no small thing even to be able to repeat a poet's lines so carefully and with so great lucidity and so accurately as I can testify that he has just done. Don't be too pleased, Mr. Pedagog, said the idiot dryly. I only wanted to show Mr. Warren that you and Mr. Whitechoker, minds of information though you are, have not yet worked up a corner on knowledge to the exclusion of the rest of us. And with these words the idiot left the table. He is a queer fellow, said the schoolmaster. He is full of pretense and hollowness, but he is sometimes almost brilliant. What you say is very true, said Mr. Whitechoker. I think he has just escaped being a smart man. I wish we could take him in hand, Mr. Pedagog, and make him more of a fellow than he is." Later in the day the poet met the idiot on the stairs. "'I say,' he said, "'I've looked all through Swinburne, and I can't find that poem.' "'I know you can't,' returned the idiot, because it isn't there. Swinburne never wrote it. It was a little thing of my own. I was only trying to get a rise out of Mr. Pedagog and his reverence with it. You have frequently appeared impressed by the undoubtedly impressive manner of these two gentlemen. I wanted to show you what their opinions were worth." "'Thank you,' returned the poet with a smile. "'Don't you want to go into partnership with me and write for the funny papers? It would be a splendid thing for me. Your ideas are so original. And I can see fun in everything, too said the idiot thoughtfully. Yes, returned the poet, even in my serious poems. Which remark made the idiot blush a little, but he soon recovered his composure and made a firm friend of the poet. The first fruits of the partnership have not yet appeared, however. As for Messrs. Whitechoker and Pedagog, when they learned how they had been deceived, they were so indignant that they did not speak to the idiot for a week. Chapter Eight. It was Sunday morning, and Mr. Whitechoker, as was his wont on the first day of the week, appeared at the breakfast-table severe as to his mien. "'Working on Sunday weighs on his mind,' the idiot said to the bibliomaniac. "'But I don't see why it should. The luxury of the rest that he allows himself the other six days of the week is surely an atonement for the hours of labor he puts in on Sunday.' But it was not this that on Sunday mornings weighed on the mind of the Reverend Mr. Whitechoker. He appeared more serious of visage then, because he had begun to think of late that his fellow boarders lived too much in the present, and ignored almost totally that which might be expected to come. He had been revolving in his mind for several weeks the question as to whether it was or was not his Christian duty to attempt to influence the lives of these men with whom the chances of life had brought him in contact. He had finally settled it to his own satisfaction that it was his duty so to do, and he had resolved, as far as lay in his power, to direct the conversation at Sunday morning's breakfast into spiritual rather than into temporal matters. So as Mrs. Pedagog was pouring the coffee, Mr. Whitechoker began. Do you gentlemen ever pause in your everyday labors and thought be let your minds rest upon the future? the possibilities it has in store for us, the consequences which—' "'No mush, thank you,' said the idiot. Then, turning to Mr. Whitechoker, he added, "'I can't answer for the other gentlemen at this board, but I can assure you, Mr. Whitechoker, that I often do so. It was only last night, sir, that my genial friend who imbibes and I were discussing the future and its possibilities, and I venture to assert that there is no more profitable food for reflection anywhere in the larders of the mind than that." "'Larders of the mind is excellent,' said the schoolmaster, with a touch of sarcasm in his voice. Perhaps you would not mind opening the door to your mental pantry and letting us peep within at the stores you keep there. 
I am sure that, on the subject in hand, your views cannot fail to be original as well as edifying." "'I am also sure,' said Mr. Whitechoker, somewhat surprised to hear the idiot speak as he did, having sometimes ventured to doubt if that flippant-minded young man ever reflected on the serious side of life. I am also sure that it is most gratifying to hear that you have done some thinking on the subject." "'I am glad you are gratified, Mr. Whitechoker replied the idiot. But I am far from taking undue credit to myself, because I reflect upon the future and its possibilities. I do not see how any man can fail to be interested in the subject, particularly when he considers the great strides science has made in the last twenty years." "'I fail to see,' said the schoolmaster, what the strides of science have to do with it." "'You fail to see so often, Mr. Pedagog returned the idiot, that I would advise your eyes to make an assignment in favor of your pupils." "'I must confess,' put in Mr. Whitechoker blandly, "'that I, too, am somewhat, er, somewhat, somewhat up a tree as to science's connection with the future?' queried the idiot. "'You have my meaning, but hardly the phraseology I should have chosen,' replied the minister. "'My style is rather epigrammatic,' said the idiot suavely. I appreciate the flattery implied by your noticing it. But science has everything to do with it. It is science that is going to make the future great. It is science that has annihilated distance, and the annihilation has just begun. Twenty years ago it was hardly possible for a man standing on one side of the street to make himself heard on the other, the acoustic properties of the atmosphere not being what they should be. Today you can stand in the pulpit of your church, and by means of certain scientific apparatus make yourself heard in Boston, New Orleans, or San Francisco. Has this no bearing on the future? The time will come, Mr. Whitechoker, when your missionaries will be able to sit in their comfortable rectories and ring up the heathen in foreign climes, and convert them over the telephone without running the slightest danger of falling into the soup, which expression I use in its literal rather than its metaphorical sense." But, interrupted Mr. Whitechoker, now wait, please, said the idiot. If science can annihilate degrees of distance, who shall say that before many days science may not annihilate degrees of time? If San Francisco, thousands of miles distant, can be brought within range of the year, why cannot 1990 be brought before the mind's eye? And if 1990 can be brought before the mind's eye, what is to prevent the invention of a prophetograph which shall enable us to cast a horoscope which shall reach all around eternity and halfway back, if not further? You do not understand me, said Mr. Whitechoker. When I speak of the future, I do not mean the temporal future. I know exactly what you mean, said the idiot. I've dealt in futures, and I am familiar with all kinds. It is you, sir, that do not understand me. My claim is perfectly plausible, and in its results is bound to make the world better. Do you suppose that any man who, by the aid of my prophetograph, sees that on a certain date in the future he will be hanged for murder is going to fail to provide himself with an alibi in regard to that particular murder? And must we not admit that, having provided himself with that alibi, he will of necessity avoid bloodshed, and so avow the gallows? That's reasonable. So in regard to all the thousand and one other peccadilloes that go to make this life a sinful one, science, by a purely logical advance along the lines already mapped out for itself, and in part already traversed, will enable men to avoid the pitfalls and reap only the windfalls of life. We shall all see what terrible consequences await on a single misstep, and we shall not make the misstep. Can you still claim that science and the future have nothing to do with each other?" "'You are talking of matters purely temporal,' said Mr. Whitechoker. "'I have reference to our spiritual future.' "'And the two, observed the idiot, are so closely allied that we cannot separate them. The proverb about looking after the pennies and letting the pounds take care of themselves applies here. I believe that if I take care of my temporal future, which by the way, does not exist, my spiritual future will take care of itself. And if science places the hereafter before us, and you admit that even now it is before us, all we have to do is to take advantage of our opportunities and mend our lives accordingly. But if 
Science shows you what is to come, said the schoolmaster. It must show your fate with perfect accuracy, or it ceases to be science, in which event your entertaining notions as to reform and so on are entirely fallacious. Not at all, said the idiot. We are approaching the time when science, which is much more liberal than any other branch of knowledge, will sacrifice even truth itself for the good of mankind. You ought to start a paradox company, suggested the doctor. Either that or make himself the nucleus of an insane asylum, observed the schoolmaster viciously. I never knew a man with such maniacal views as those we have heard this morning. There is a great deal, Mr. Pedagog, that you have never known, returned the idiot. Stick by me, and you'll die with a mind richly stored. Whereat the schoolmaster left the table with such manifest impatience that Mr. Whitechoker was sorry he had started the conversation. The genial gentleman, who occasionally imbibed, and the idiot withdrew to the latter's room, where the former observed, What are you driving at, anyhow? Where did you get those crazy ideas? I ate Welsh rarebit last night and dreamed em, returned the idiot. I thought as much, said his companion. What deuced fine things dreams are, anyhow. Chapter 9 Breakfast was nearly over, and it was of such exceptionally good quality that very few remarks had been made. Finally the ball was set rolling by the lawyer. How many packs of cigarettes do you smoke a day? he asked, as the idiot took one from his pocket and placed it at the side of his coffee cup. Never more than forty-six, said the idiot. Why? Do you think of starting a cigarette stand? Not at all, said Mr. Brief. I was only wondering what chance you had to live to maturity, that's all. Your maturity period will be in about eight hundred and sixty years from now, the way I calculate, and it seemed to me that, judging from the number of cigarettes you smoke, you were not likely to last through more than two or three of those years. Oh, I expect to live longer than that, said the idiot. I think I'm good for at least four years. Don't you, doctor? I decline to have anything to say about your case, retorted the doctor whose feeling toward the idiot was not surpassingly affectionate. "'In that event I shall probably live five years more,' said the idiot. The doctor's lip curled, but he remained silent. "'You'll live,' put in Mr. Pedagog with a chuckle. "'The good die young.' "'How did you happen to keep alive all this time, then, Mr. Pedagog?' asked the idiot. "'I have always eschewed tobacco in every form, for one thing,' said Mr. Pedagog. I am surprised, put in the idiot. That's really a bad habit, and I marvel greatly that you should have done it. The schoolmaster frowned and looked at the idiot over the rims of his glasses, as was his wont when he was intent upon getting explanations. Done what? he asked severely. Chewed tobacco, replied the idiot. You just said that one of the things that has kept you lingering in this veil of tears was that you have always chewed tobacco. I never did that, and I never shall do it, because I deem it a detestable diversion." "'I didn't say anything of the sort,' retorted Mr. Pedagog, getting red in the face. "'I never said that I chewed tobacco in any form.' "'Oh, come,' said the idiot, with well-feigned impatience. "'What's the use of talking that way? We all heard what you said, and I have no doubt that it came as a shock to every member of this assemblage.' It certainly was a shock to me, because, with all my weaknesses and bad habits, I think tobacco-chewing unutterably bad. The worst part of it is that you chew it in every form. A man who chews chewing tobacco only may sometime throw off the habit, but when one gets to be such a victim to it that he chews up cigars and cigarettes and plugs of pipe tobacco, it seems to me that he is incurable. It is not only a bad habit, then, it amounts to a vice." Mr. Pedagog was getting apoplectic. "'You know well enough that I never said the words you attribute to me,' he said sternly. "'Really, Mr. Pedagog?' returned the idiot, with an irritating shake of his head, as if he were confidently hinting to the schoolmaster to keep quiet. "'Really, you pain me by these futile denials. Nobody forced you into the confession. You made it entirely of your own volition. 
Now I ask you, as a man and brother, what's the use of saying anything more about it? We believe you to be a person of the strictest veracity, but when you say a thing before a table full of listeners one minute and deny it the next, we are forced to one of two conclusions, neither of which is pleasing. We must conclude that either repenting your confession you sacrifice the truth, or that the habit to which you have confessed has entirely destroyed your perception of the moral question involved. Undue use of tobacco has, I believe, driven men crazy. Opium-eating has destroyed all regard for truth in one whose word has always been regarded as good as a government bond. I presume the undue use of tobacco can accomplish the same sad result. By the way, did you ever try opium? Opium is ruin, said the doctor. Mr. Pedagog's indignation being so great that he seemed to be unable to find the words he was evidently desirous of hurling at the idiot. It is indeed, said the idiot. I knew a man once who smoked one little pipeful of it, and while under its influence sat down at his table and wrote a story of the supernatural order that was so good that everybody said he must have stolen it from Poe or some other master of the weird, and now nobody will have anything to do with him. Tobacco, however, in the sane use of it is a good thing. I don't know of anything that is more satisfying to the tired man than to lie back on a sofa of an evening and puff clouds of smoke and rings into the air. One of the finest dreams I ever had came from smoking. I had blown a great mountain of smoke out into the room, and it seemed to become real, and I climbed it to its summit and saw the most beautiful country at my feet, a country in which all men were happy where there were no troubles of any kind, where no whim was left ungratified, where jealousies were not, and where every man who made more than enough to live on paid the surplus into the common treasury for the use of those who hadn't made quite enough. It was a national realization of the golden rule, and I maintain that if smoking were bad, nothing so good, even in the abstract form of an idea, could come out of it. That's a very nice thought said the poet. I'd like to put that into verse, the idea of people dividing up their surplus of wealth among the less successful strugglers is beautiful. You can have it, said the idiot, with a pleased smile. I don't write poetry of that kind myself unless I work hard, and I've found that when the poet works hard he produces poems that read hard. You are welcome to it. Another time I was dreaming over my cigar after a day of the hardest kind of trouble at the office. Everything had gone wrong with me, and I was blue as indigo. I came home here, lit a cigar, and threw myself down upon my bed and began to puff. I felt like a man in a deep pit, out of which there was no way of getting. I closed my eyes for a second, and to all intents and purposes I lay in that pit. And then what did tobacco do for me? Why, it lifted me right out of my prison. I thought I was sitting on a rock down in the depths. The stars twinkled tantalizingly above me. They invited me to freedom, knowing that freedom was not attainable. Then I blew a ring of smoke from my mouth, and it began to rise slowly at first, and then, catching in the current of air, it flew upward more rapidly, widening constantly until it disappeared in the darkness above. Then I had a thought. I filled my mouth as full of smoke as possible, and blew forth the greatest ring you ever saw. And as it started to rise, I grasped it in my two hands. It struggled beneath my weight, lengthened out into an elliptical link, and broke and let me down with a dull thud. Then I made two rings, grasping one with my left hand and the other with my right. And they lifted you out of the pit, I suppose, sneered the bibliomaniac. I do not say that they did, said the idiot calmly. But I do know that when I opened my eyes I wasn't in the pit any longer, but upstairs in my hall bedroom. How awfully mysterious, said the doctor satirically. Well, I don't approve of smoking, said Mr. Whitechoker. I agree with the London divine who says it is the pastime of perdition. It is not prompted by natural instincts. It is only the habit of artificial civilization. Dogs and horses and birds get along without it. Why shouldn't man? Hear, hear, cried Mr. Pedagog, clapping his hands approvingly. Where, where, put in the idiot. 
That's a great argument. Dogs don't put up in boarding houses. Is the boarding house therefore the result of a degraded artificial civilization? I have seen educated horses that didn't smoke, but I have never seen an educated horse, or an uneducated one for that matter, that had even had the chance to smoke, or the kind of mouth that would enable him to do it in case he had the chance. I have also observed that horses don't read books, that birds don't eat mutton chops, that dogs don't go to the opera, that donkeys don't play the piano, at least four-legged donkeys don't. So you might as well argue that since horses, dogs, birds, and donkeys get along without literature, music, mutton chops, and piano playing— You've covered music, put in the lawyer, who liked to be precise. True, but piano playing isn't always music, returned the idiot. You might as well argue because the beasts and the birds do without these things man ought to. Fish don't smoke, neither do they join the police force. Therefore man should neither smoke nor become a guardian of the peace. Nevertheless, it is the pastime of perdition, insisted Mr. Whitechoker. No, it isn't, retorted the idiot. Smoking is the business of perdition. It smokes because it has to. There, there, remonstrated Mr. Pedagog. You mean, here, here, I presume, said the idiot. I mean that you have said enough, remarked Mr. Pedagog sharply. Very well, said the idiot. If I have convinced you all, I am satisfied not to say gratified. But really, Mr. Pedagog, he added, rising to leave the room, if I were you, I'd give up the practice of chewing. Hold on a minute, Mr. Idiot, said Mr. Whitechoker, interrupting. He was desirous that Mr. Pedagog should not be further irritated. Let me ask you one question. Does your old father smoke? No, said the idiot, leaning easily over the back of his chair. No. What of it? Nothing at all, except that perhaps if he could get along without it, you might, suggested the clergyman. He couldn't get along without it if he knew what good tobacco was, said the idiot. Then why don't you introduce him to it? asked the minister. Because I do not wish to make him unhappy, returned the idiot softly. He thinks his seventy years have been the happiest years that any mortal ever had, and if now, in his seventy-first year, he discovered that during the whole period of his manhood he had been deprived through ignorance of so great a blessing as a good cigar, he'd become like the rest of us, living in anticipation of delights to come, and not finding approximate bliss in living over the past. Trust me, my dear Mr. Whitechoker, to look after him. He and my mother and my life are all I have." The idiot left the room, and Mr. Pedagog put in a greater part of the next half hour in making personal statements to the remaining boarders to the effect that the word he used was eschewed, and not the one attributed to him by the idiot. Strange to say, most of them were already aware of that fact. End of Part Two of the Idiot by John Kendrick Bangs